a radical look at Scotch history with Stuart McHardy. Part 18, The Reformation, Part 1. When Martin Luther penned his 95 Theses in Württemberg in 1517, he was attempting to start a discussion within the Christian Church about matters such as the sale of indulgences. This was the process by which, if you had enough money, you could buy forgiveness for just about anything from the Church. There was already widespread dissatisfaction throughout Europe with what people saw as corruption in the Church, with priests and bishops acting in often blatantly worldly ways, fathering children, amassing wealth, and generally behaving like members of the temporal aristocracies across Europe. Now, although Luther's theses were essentially theological, they did give rise to a movement that was to tear the established church apart and lead to numerous wars, infighting, and to this day, levels of sectarianism that, to the non-Christian, seem to be in direct contradiction of what that religion is supposed to be about. The irony of going to war to defend one interpretation of the words and intentions of the peaceful and forgiving Lamb of God never fails to amaze. This is, of course, also true of many other religions, as the world knows all too well. By the time that the ideas of the Protestant religion that developed in the aftermath of Luther's ideas reached Scotland, boundaries had been well set. And it has been noticed by many that the early Christian church was in many ways a reconfiguration of the Roman Empire, and the hierarchic structure, the intolerance of dissent, and the brutality of so much conversion of the heathens that followed are very well documented. My attitude towards it is simple, you can believe what you want, but as soon as you try to get others to follow your ideas rather than their own, particularly by using force, then you've transgressed your basic humanity. Now while many of the Stuart kings had regularly clashed with leading families, Mary Stuart was faced with opposition of an entirely different character. As early as 1528, a nobleman, Patrick Hamilton, had been burned at the stake as a heretic in St Andrews. His death, though, if anything, furthered interest in the new ideas of reform. And in March 1546, George Wishart, a preacher who had found ready audiences in several parts of the country, was also burned at the stake as a heretic, though times had changed. The attacks on the reforming ideas of the new Protestants were being led by Cardinal Beaton, who was a strong supporter of Mary Stuart's mother, Mary de Guise, who in her own time as regent brought in many Frenchmen, all Catholics, to positions of power in Scotland. Now Beaton himself had tried in vain to become regent for the infant queen and was hated by many of the Protestant lords. In May of 1546, just a couple of months after Wishart's death, Beaton was assassinated in St Andrews and one major obstacle to the onset of the Reformation was removed. All of this took place against the plotting of Henry VIII to arrange a marriage between his son and Mary Stuart with a long term of England taking over Scotland. English kings were very predictable. However, as long as Mary's mother, Mary of Guise, was regent of Scotland, French influence would continue to dominate and the country continued to be, at least on the surface, Catholic. In England, Henry VIII had split away from the Catholic Church as early as 1533 and declared himself head of the new Church of England. Many still believe that his actions were driven solely by the need to divorce his first wife, Catherine of Argon, who had given him a daughter, Mary, despite having been pregnant a total of seven times. Henry wanted a male heir and saw he could mould the intellectual and theological movements that were sweeping across Europe, driven by opposition to religious corruption, to his own advantage. In Scotland, in the late 1540s, some attempts were made to deal with the problems, generally of corruption, facing the established Catholic Church, but there was little that could be done in the face of the new Protestantism that was spreading across the country. Matters came to a head in 1559. John Knox, who had been exiled to England for his reforming activities after briefly being a prisoner of the French, he was then forced to flee from England when Henry VIII's elder daughter came to the throne as Mary I, and she briefly reinstated Catholicism. Knox went off to Switzerland, where he met and studied with Calvin, who had a strong influence on his thinking. He then came back to Scotland in 1555 for a short period and though he preached widely, 
and was effectively left alone by the authorities, he then went back to Geneva. Coming back to Scotland in 1559, he preached a sermon in Perth on May the 11th on the topic of Christ cleansing the temple. This sparked off a major riot there, soon followed by others in different parts of the country, including the capital Edinburgh. All over the country there were then attacks on churches and monasteries, and there was widespread destruction of artefacts and records. In the following years, the vast majority of the ornate carved stone crosses on the ancient religious centre of Iona disappeared, and it was believed many were dumped in the sea. The vandalism of this period, under the guise of religion, was a great tragedy, and there is a school of thought that thinks that at least some of it was controlled by the large landowners who were following an agenda of their own, a point we will consider further. A group of these so-called noblemen had banded together to push for a reform, calling themselves the Lords of the Congregation, and soon they and Knox were in open armed rebellion against Mary de Guise, who was still acting as regent. She called to France for support, while the Protestants looked to England for help. In 1560, there was a standoff with a couple of thousand French troops in Leith and a large English fleet out in the Forth when, in June, Mary de Guise died. Under the subsequent Treaty of Edinburgh, both French and English forces left Scotland and the Protestant Lords of Congregation were now in effective control of the country. Meeting in August, the Scottish Parliament approved a reformed confession of faith, officially abolishing Catholicism as the origin of the country and putting an end to papal jurisdiction over religion. Scotland was now a Protestant country, but the troubles caused by religion were far from over. A year after this meeting of the Scottish Parliament, the recently widowed Mary Stuart returned from France. She accepted the Protestant ascendancy, but would not give up her own Catholicism. She did, however, point her half-brother, the illegitimate Earl of Murray, a staunch Protestant, as her chief advisor. Knox, meanwhile, was preaching sermons against Mary and kings in general. Although he should be remembered for his role in developing the idea that rulers cannot rule, except with the consent of the ruled, Knox was perhaps not quite the hero the Presbyterians like to claim, a point which we will return to next time. What was abundantly clear by now was that Protestantism in Scotland was a different beast entirely from the newly established form of religion in England. While Henry VIII had declared himself the head of the church and kept roles of bishops and archbishops, just like the Catholic Church, in Scotland the influence of Calvinism was much stronger. Although over the years the image of the puritanical, fun-hating Presbyterian church has preserved, there was much to the Scottish Presbyterianism that has been beneficial. I have mentioned that Knox made a worthwhile contribution to modern thinking about the relationships between power and people, but other aspects of the early church also left a considerable legacy. There was a general rigid rejection of anything they considered ostentatious or indulgence in general, and one thing that they did do for Scotland continues to have ramifications today. This was the idea that all humans, as God's creatures, should have access to the Word of God, as expressed through the Christian Bible. The idea that you needed to have a priest as intermediary between yourself and your God was anathema to them. As we shall see, this was to fundamentally change Scottish society. Throughout 1562 and 1563, the tension between Queen Mary and the leading Protestants continued. She had several face-to-face -face meetings with Knox, in one of which she made clear his belief that if monarchs broke the law, people had the right to replace them. Something that is effectively there in the 1320 Declaration of Arbroath. Although the Protestant ascendancy had been instituted by Parliament in 1560, there were still many leading families espousing Catholicism, and their support for the Queen meant that religion continued to affect the stability of the country. When Mary was at last forced to flee in 1568, it seemed that the Protestant ascendancy was assured, especially when Knox preached at the coronation of Mary's infant son, James VI. As the following centuries showed in both Scotland and England, things were not so simple. Next thing, the Reformation Part 2.